a truer, more descriptive career in the heart of the heart of the world. We're going to interesting time as Christians. We're in a kind of another world between two events, one of which has happened and the other of which is promised to happen. The first thing that's happened, of course, is Christ's passion, his death, and his resurrection. And his telling us, in no uncertain terms, that he's coming again. The future event, of course, that hasn't yet happened, is a second coming. And here we are in the middle. Here we are at this time between the resurrection and the second coming. Since Jesus died with us, we have accepted God's gracious gift to him as a Messiah, and we continue to work as best we can to witness to God's love revealed in him. But we have to be asking the question, what is our life to look like? How are we to conduct ourselves as a Christian community, having received this marvelous gift? What are the tensions that beset us in this period between the already event 2,000 years ago and the not yet event that is about to happen? Well, it's a very big important thing that's about us this time. One is God raised Jesus Christ from the dead in order to demonstrate for us that nothing but nothing stands between us and his love. Nothing stands between us and companionship with him. And nothing stands in the way, really, of us to be in communion with one another. We've experienced the induction of a new era of God's kingdom, a new era of hope that Christ himself held up and articulated and invited us to hold fast. We have the hope of the possibility of Jesus of striving to be a sign and a witness and a foretaste of what's to come. Do we get there? Are we perfect in that quest? Of course not. But we've shown the way. At the same time, we live in this not yet time. God has broken into our lives and creation has bridged the gulf of estrangement between us. But God, God's reign is not yet clearly manifest. On this earth. It's not yet fully played out. Sin and separation from God in all its variety is all too evident in the world right now, isn't it? Somebody pushed a button last week and 298 people, innocent people, were killed. We think we feel in Canada and imagine the 175 Dutch citizens who are on Malaysia Point 17. And what about the tens of thousands of children, dispossessed children? who are showing up at the southern borders of the United States, obviously painfully let go from their families by their parents in the hope that they would be accepted into the United States in a better life. Imagine giving up your child, watching them go for a better life. It's all too easy to focus on these disturbing events that are surround us rather than on the ways that God is working in us right now and through us in the world around us. It's too easy to become fixated on those things and frankly to become discouraged. The good news, both in terms of today and also in the gospel sense, is that we have a standing invitation to take God's invitation to live faithfully present while we wait, just like Abraham and Sarah did, who waited in the hope that God's promises would be fulfilled to them. Paul's epistle today tries at the heart of this issue. The issue is identity, of who it is that we're called to be in this never time between the already happened and the not yet happened. His epistle today points out that if we are led by the Spirit, then we are counted as God's own. Period. We are His children. 
and that we receive what Paul calls the spirit of adoption. And what a powerful metaphor is that word adoption. In a world where so many children are loved, where thousands are disenfranchised, adoption has a special meaning. In a world where many couples struggle, struggle with infertility in the hopes of having a child, adoption has a special meaning. And in a world where millions of children, literally millions, have lost their parents to disease, starvation, violence, adoption has a special meaning, a special hope. To them and to us, the act of adoption and being adopted is an act of grace. A grace that would open the doors of a family's home to someone who is biologically unrelated, but nevertheless is gifted with all the gifts of love and resources that the family can offer. That's the adoption we have received. The fact that God has chosen us and incorporated us into a Christ-shaped family comprised of men, women, and children of all races and classes is a powerful reality that we are invited to think about. As God's adopted children, we also inherit a new identity, a separate and new identity, one that brings new life but one that also brings challenges and entails suffering. Colin has reminded us in many ways and many times that being a Christian, relatively easy here, is a very difficult thing to be in other parts of the world, a very dangerous thing to be. At times it is easy being a Christian, and Paul knows this whole well when he says in today's Gospel, verse 15, I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is about to be revealed. And having shared his humanity with us, Jesus knew them too. That's the beauty of Jesus as God. As having experienced our humanity, he felt exactly the things that we feel. He felt uncertainty in the garden. He knew his destiny as the Son of God. And he felt it. He felt the frustration of money changes in the temple. And he took no second back seat to fighting with them. He felt deep sadness at the death of his friend Lazarus. And I think also sadness in the community who were witness to that death and didn't understand the resurrection of Mr. Paul. Paul lays out in detail what a life in the spirit looks like. He said, love what is genuine. And you'll know it when you see it. Your heart will resonate with it. Love it. Shun evil in all its forms, no matter what the cost and the times it's costly. It's time, and sometimes it's costly to stand up and say, that's wrong. Bullying in schools, other things that go on, sometimes it's costly to call it out. Be patient in suffering and sadness, because the suffering and sadness seems to go on for on and on and ever and ever. And we get impatient, hoping for a resolution. Persevere in prayer. And perhaps hardest of all, strive to live peaceably with all, including those who are persecuted. So how does all this relate to our time, this here and now, between the already and the not yet of Christ's resurrection and his coming again? Well, it seems to me that in some very provocative ways, the 21st century society that now surrounds us is starting to look in many ways like the social context in which Jesus' first followers found themselves all those years ago. The church, the temple, is declining as a center of society. As a formal and formal attendance of mainline churches continues to decline over time. Formal and mainline. Religious options abound in the spiritual, quote, marketplace, including the temptations of a sumptuous living or a fast buck in the name of God. And don't we all know examples of both of those having played themselves out? There are more spiritual tourists and church consumers than ever before. 
Yet these symptoms in themselves, I think, reveal an opportunity. An opportunity to move in the direction of fulfilling what God is asking us to do. What God is asking us to wear as our identity as Christians, and then how to play that identity out. It's precisely because Christians and the church are becoming increasingly marginalized in society that we will increasingly find ourselves free, unconstrained, liberated more than ever before to become the conscious society that Paul is inviting us to be. All the shift in power away from mainline church denominations can be painful at first glance, and I suspect more painful to some than to others. It could nevertheless empower us to find ourselves in the reflection of the less fortunate, as well as to undertake and accomplish what others, quite frankly, in society would deem to be a pitiful waste of time. Paul invites us to understand ourselves as that alternative community, a community that takes an alternative to the destructive tendencies of life and grace by the larger, self-edifying, consumer-focused culture that surrounds us. The world around us wants everything, and it wants it now, and it wants it faster, and it wants it better, and it wants it cheaper. The world around us can be optimistic at times, but all too often it's devoid of hope. But Paul exhorts us to be both patient and hopeful, because these are aspirations of the heart, and they are the fruit of the Spirit. He exhorts us to patience as we await the new reality of God's promise. Not on our time, but on His. He exhorts us to patience and attentiveness for a God who is working in our midst right now, every day. And He exhorts us to patience in our community and with one another as we work to reflect His love to those in the world around us. Continue to thirst. Thirst. 